Okay, good morning everyone. So we are switching to English. Yani Panimayo Paruski. That's the only Russian I know. So today we are going to talk about uh, the digital twins. So it's, it's a buzzword. We are hearing it a lot lately. And unfortunately, I think I gave a very long name for the lecture today. So that was my mistake. It should be done GIS for digital twins. That's it. So what is digital twin? It's digital twin is a representation of the real world where you try to simulate the relationship between the objects. You create objects and try to uh, stimulate the relationship between them. And GIS gives you the tools to map the real world and create this relationship between the real world objects, such as buildings, lands, nature, and so on. Just a quick question. Who never heard about GIS? OK. So GIS is Geographical Information System. Uh, you are using it daily in your life. When you call Yandex, it will try to find the closest car to you. So that's a GIS using the Geographical Information System and trying to find the closest car next to you. Or when you're trying, or somebody trying to open a new Jazva Cafe branch or Starbucks, you will try to find where are the human population densities, where are people existing a lot, and where are the existing cafes, the competition, then try to find where is the best location for you. So this is GIS in a very nutshell. We are linking maps to database and then having different layers and trying to find the relationship between them. So going back to digital twins, Yesterday, I was attending a, a lecture for uh, Dr. Uh, Karekin. And he was talking about, again, digital twin, but on an atomic level. So they were trying to find the relationship between the atoms to find cures for different diseases. They were trying to uh, map the relationship and uh, create a digital twin for the cells and molecules and so on. So going from the macro to the cosmos, you can create any digital twin to find and simulate the real world to find specific answer, specific question. So going back to GIS now, GIS gives you the tools to uh, create a digital twin of the land, the nature, uh, create a digital twin of the buildings. When engineers are trying to construct a building, they want to test it against earthquakes and different hazards. So this is a digital twin. They are trying to do different scenarios and see what is the result going back. So this is an important thing. For networks and utilities, for example, and we had, uh, I think, uh, you have here from the utility network, who they try to digitize the utility network and see what will be the load when there is, a, uh, when there is an issue in one of the uh, outlets, which customers will be affected. So this is another digital twin exercise. We have cities. We want to try to see the city itself, how the city is performing and what are the functions and how we can enhance the existing city. So all these are digital twins and GIS is a framework to try to simulate the real world. And what does GIS do? The first part, the most important, GIS is a framework to collect the data. So you can capture data using different sensors. One of them is the satellite imagery, but there are lots more. And then once you capture the data, GIS provides you the tools to create maps and visualize the information. And moving for forward, then you start doing your analysis to answer specific questions. And finally, you share your results through different tools that are available. And we will show you all this in a live demo. I'm not going to talk a lot. It's just 14 slides. And then we'll go to the fun stuff. So as I said, data capturing is very important. We have lots of drones now, cheap drones, where you can uh, capture drone imagery, you have satellite. So the volume of the information is getting bigger and bigger. The issue now is to retrieve this information and access it when you need it. And then again, you can use GIS to do 
different kinds of data modeling. For example, if I have the data footprints, the building footprints, I can just extrude them and create 3D buildings out of it, which we will show it later on. And then you integrate different systems into one environment. Once you do the data capturing, then you start doing visualization either by 2D maps or 3D uh, visualization. Also, you can create different reports out of it. So visualization is not just maps. You can create different infographics, for example, out of the data that you are having. Okay. Analysis. There are lots of analysis. Lately, we are hearing artificial intelligence a lot, which we will show different examples out of it. But we've been using artificial intelligence for the last 10 years, but we were not calling it. So you have classification, which is kind of artificial intelligence. If we have any GIS majors here, we use different classification methods to understand, for example, what is the land use uh, land classification. Is it an agricultural land or it's an urban area? This is a classification. Then you have the machine learning to do object detection and segmentation. If I want to find all the palm trees, for example, I use machine learning now to detect this object. And again, we will show different examples. And then you have predictive modeling. You want to know the future, how it will be. And all these are part of the GIS uh, tools. Finally, as I said, <coughs> we are using GIS to communicate, which is very important. You do all your results, your analysis and research, then you want to communicate your, uh, your results. And again, having a modern way to communicate this information is very important. And there are lots of tools online available now to do that. And I will be using one of them now to do the demonstration. <coughs> So going back, why do we need digital uh, models? First, to capture a screenshot of the current existing models. So we are taking historical records. We want to see, for example, what was Yerevan city five years ago? What was Yerevan city 10 years ago? And then do the comparison and see what is the change? How is the urban growing? We want to understand how is it operating? If we have uh, IOTs, uh, information of things or sensors, live sensors. We want to see on the map how things are working. Where is the traffic or where is the most consumption of electricity and what we can do about it. And third, we do testing and predicting using the digital twins. These are the three main reasons why people need digital twins. Of course, uh, for technology companies, we always try to uh, make it very easy and simple, which is not. Digital twins are very complicated. It requires lots of investment, both financially and in human capacity. But once you have a proper roadmap and a plan, the, then you can do lots of things with the existing environment. So let me go to the fun stuff. So here we have a digital twin, which I closed, I think. Yeah, I have it. I don't believe in history. <laughs> so the, the fine gentleman before me, he was talking about the the big number of uh, existing satellites, which, which is around 35 and more thousand satellites. So this is a digital twin of the space now around us. And we can, we can see the interaction and we can search for different uh, satellites and see what is their current live uh, position. And uh, usually this has lots of uh, applications for defense, for example, countries are defending their uh, secure location by, for example, beaming laser beams to the satellite when they know that it will pass above them. So this is one example of a space digital twin. So digital twin can go from atoms to the space. But talking about something more close to our heart, 
we, we try to create a digital twin of Yerevan. So, of course, it wasn't very easy to get any data from the cadaster, so we had to create our own data. So we used uh, artificial intelligence to first uh, classify all the green areas. So here, as you can see, this is done all automatically. We didn't spend, we spent maybe one or two days to digitize the locations. <coughs> Sorry. And once we had it digitized, then we created a 3D model out of it. I'm not sure if it's very visible here, but is this mouse working? Okay. So this is, a, this is the, the green area. Then we, we digitized the buildings. Again, using the, the machine learning and created a 3D visualization. So here we are talking about data capturing. It's, it's a pretty heavy 3D model, so it might be a little bit slow. But the idea is I'm using GIS to collect data. Now this is the data capturing part. And also I'm, I'm visualizing it, so uh, you can see how digit, uh, GIS is being used. And as I said, GIS can be used to integrate different frameworks. So here, in addition to the data that I created, I imported different data set from uh, different resources to create the city, to have more realistic view out of it. And as I said, we had lots of resources. One of them is uh, open street maps, for example. So we, we got all the point of interest and map them to the 3D so we have a better understanding of the existing facilities. It's not just a visualization. We also, once we have the data, we can start doing different analysis. Who, who can tell me which, which building is this? Let me, let me zoom out a little bit. Yes, Yerevan State University. So using artificial intelligence, I can quickly uh, generate data from the data which I created already. So here, uh, I, I did digitize all the windows and doors on this university. And this can be used, again, for different reasons. One of them is real estate. If you want to sell an apartment, you want to show the client what they can see from each window. So you can do that kind of analysis. On the other hand, if you want to secure a convoy, you don't want snipers to get shot of it. Again, you should know where are the windows uh, around the, the, the building. Going on a city level uh, digital model, I can uh, simulate the sun radiation. So I want to see uh, how much sun energy I will get. I want to enhance the energy quality. So here again, taking the building information into consideration, I created this uh, sun radiation model. And once I have it, I can start uh, calculating how much sun exposure I will get from the roofs if I want to put a solar panel. So if I decide that I will put a solar panel here, let me put one there, I can start calculating and know that, for example, if I click on this point, in August, I'll get around 7,000 kilowatt per day. This is in August, not in the, in the winter. So as you see, once you have a digital model, you can start creating different analysis out of it. Another analysis is visibility. If I have a convoy, uh, if I have this building, I want to uh, know which room is, has the best view on the street. Uh, if I'm promoted, I want to decide the room. So I want to see, for example, uh, doing this kind of view shed analysis, I can get the information and say, for example, here, let me see. The darker the green, it means it has a better view. So here, for example, has 85% visibility on the street. Moving forward, if I want to, to build a new building here, I try to do something very ugly. So this is the building that I want to build. I want to calculate how much shadow this will, cost, uh, will cast on the green area on behind it. So here I can see that this region is having, ha, has lots of shadow. I can even quantify it and say, show me only the areas that will get more than two hours 
per day shadow if I build this building. So as you see, these are different uh, usage where we first collected the data using GIS, we created the data using artificial intelligence, then we visualized it, and then we started doing analysis. And finally, I was able to show you the, the information using different tools and uh, uh, environment. Showing you another example, now I want to build, this is more uh, digital twin of the health sector, let's say. So, Ministry of Health asked us to, uh, they want to uh, optimize the emergency response service, ambulances, in the Shirak area. So currently, uh, they have around six uh, stations in Shirak, and they were collecting data for all the uh, emergency calls that they got. So for 12 months, they had around 85,000 records. Most of them were not digitized, so they didn't have any information about the location. It was just a description of the address. And they wanted to see what we can do to enhance this service. So once we started analyzing the, the information, we noticed that there were, anyway, there were issues in the data where there was a sudden spike in August 22 for two regions. Uh, I think it was Gyumri and Ahuriam. So this was, again, the analysis started to show us if there are any issues in the data or not. But then using artificial intelligence we and NLP, we digitized all the locations, the 85,000 uh, points. And you can see, for example, here, if I, let me stop. So this is time enabled, daily, the calls that they are getting uh, for emergency response. Moving forward now, so we started using GIS first. We have around 126 uh, communities and villages in Shirak area. So what we did, and also, as I said, these are the six uh, emergency response stations, the ambulances. And each one of them, they did it administratively. Each one of them is responsible for the region that they are in. Uh, it's not based on geography, it's based on administrative boundaries. And also, of course, there are uh, 14 hospitals and clinics in, in Gyumri area, uh, not in the other regions. Now, uh, as I said, uh, I don't know if you can see the lines, but each, each station is responsible for the uh, communities that they are in. in the, once we digitize all the data, you can see that now these are the purple represents the emergency calls. And mostly they are in the uh, big cities. If I zoom more, for example, it's, 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 it goes to the building level. And here we are visualizing around, as I said, 85,000 uh, records. So if I zoom in more, zoom a little bit more, I can click, I want to find, for example, if I click on this point, so these are the details of that call. What time they received the call, how much time did it take to process the, the call, and when did they arrive, and what was the result of the call? Did the guy got well, or unfortunately he was uh, passed away, and so on. So, taking all this data, we started doing basic analysis. We realized that, for example, most of the calls are between uh, 6.30 to 9, 9 o'clock p.m. Uh, on the weekends. And uh, interestingly, on the weekdays, there were some hot spots in the morning, but not at night. And again, using the space-time cube information, or the location information and the time information, we created the space-time cubes. So here you can see, this is a, another way of representation. We started to represent the cause as space-time cubes. Each one of these cubes represent the number of the calls in one week. And the higher it is, the newer it is. So if I click on one of them here, for example, here, this is the calls, number of calls for this region from 11.24 uh, to 12.1, uh, there were around 26 calls. 
So this is space-time cube. It, it's, it, it helps us to start understanding the pattern and start doing different analysis. So using this information, what we did, we created, the, we started to understand the trend. Where are the new hotspots? Where are the hotspots themselves? Which areas we should consider uh, to put more stations? So if I, if I zoom to one of these, for example, here, if I click on this, based on our analysis, this is, this is a new hotspot. It wasn't there before. Now it started to appear. And we have the, the statistic significance of it. If I zoom to another place, for example, here, we see that in the city center, it's always a hotspot. People are always calling it. So the, the type of the, the, the hotspot is a persistent hotspot. There are other types also. For example, here we have new hotspots. Uh, these are historical hotspots. So they were hotspots before, then they got better and so on. Moving forward, using this information, I can start doing predictive analysis. I, I can start understanding what will be the, 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 the demand in the future. So here, and, and the power of GIS, we have lots of statistical models to predict, but when you add it to the GIS, the GIS can change the model based on the location. Usually statisticians, they use the same statistical model for the whole data set, sorry. But when you start using GIS, this model can start changing based on the location that it's being implemented on. So to give it more clear example, here, if I click on this point, I see that I am predicting for week one after the finish of the data. So the next week, I'll get 127 calls. In week two, I'll get 137 and so on. So I'm, I can prepare the workforce to respond to this kind of request. But the interesting part here that using GIS and artificial intelligence, I, I had several statistical model, but I selected the S-shape model for this specific region. If I zoom to another place, here for example, you will see that I used another model. This is AI model. It's called uh, forest-based, based on the location that I'm here. So I, am, I have all the models. The machine is trying all the models, then trying to see which one has the least error uh, and can represent the model in the best possible way. Moving more forward to classical method, this is the final part, where, again, now we have all this information. We know what is the demand. Uh, we know what will the future be, the forecasting. Now we want to plan our for, uh, workforce and put policies for the decision makers. For example, for the time being, there is a policy saying that any emergency call should be answered within I think it's 15 minutes if it's in an urban area and 30 minutes if it's in a rural area. So if I want to visualize this information, I create this driving service area from each receiving station. So the red color represents driving for 30 minutes. The blue is, I think, 15 minutes and the green is five minutes. If I zoom to some of the rural area, you will see Whatever you do from these stations, you will never reach them in 30 minutes. So there is no way. It's not the fault of the station. It's not the fault of the driver. It's not possible to reach to this location within 30 minutes. So maybe I have to change my station location to be able to serve these communities. And also, if I visualize from each community what is the closest emergency station, you will see it's not related to the administrative boundaries. So if I zoom to these communities here, although they are served by this station, they are in the same region, administrative boundary, but it will be much faster for them to come to the other station here in this location. And uh, this is not serving the administrative boundary, but geographically it makes sense. So we have to change the way that we think when we are dividing these regions and boundaries. Now, so what's next? 
as I said, we have six stations now. If I want to forget about these six and say, okay, I have all these buildings, please select what are the best locations to serve all the communities that are there. And you have 30 minutes to reach to any community. Using that GIS will try to find what is the best number of stations that you can use. So here, it automatically selected this, I think it's six stations to serve all the communities that are there in the station. So we have to change the existing one to this one to serve all the communities. If somebody else comes and says, okay, instead of 30 minutes, I want to reach in 20 minutes. Tell me how many stations I will need. Again, you can run that kind of, again, we have this digital twin. We are running different scenarios. And now I can see that instead of six, I need 10 uh, stations from the candidates that I had to serve all the communities. And still, I will have several communities which is impossible to reach within 20 minutes. So in conclusion, as I said, GIS can be used for different things. The main purpose today, which I was talking, it is one of the major forces to enable the digital twin because it helps you integrate different systems in one environment and integrate different data sources in one to run your different analysis. If you have any questions, please feel free. You can ask in Armenian also if you want. Uh, I do collect some data about uh, road quality and add to the, your analyze to understand uh, the time of travel. Yeah, very good question. Uh, what we are doing here, we are using a service. Uh, it's hosted by a company called Here. It was Navtech before. So they take into consideration, like Yandex, they take into consideration the speed that you can go, taking into consideration the quality of the road and the uh, space. Uh, fine, so right, Yandex provides uh, the traffic data. What's that? Uh, Yandex provides the traffic data. As well, yes, it provides, but we are not using it here. Thanks a lot. Uh, it's an interesting report. And uh, I would like to, to prolongate the question of the previous uh, uh, so, um, guy. Uh, you see, you are showing uh, all this uh, uh, activity on the base of rather heavy instrument like ARCIS platform. And, uh, as I understand, it's uh, much more oriented on uh, P2G or such kind of uh, geospatial analytic activity uh, in hands of uh, some uh, official services and so on. And uh, when we are talking about uh, a new era of uh, uh, big communication the flow with the uh, person activity and so on, how to implement more uh, more actively in such kind of uh, feedback activity and so like uh, a Yandex traffic jam uh, uh, gathering of the data and so on and so on. So uh, one Part of my question is how to simplify such kind of technology in terms of uh, uh, mass uh, uh, in, uh, investigators or someone else. And the another part is uh, uh, do you see any uh, uh, perspective of uh, combination with the, another type of uh, approach like uh, meta universe or NFT activity in uh, uh, such kind of virtual world uh, generation and so on to test uh, and because the aim is uh, the same to test uh, 
uh, uh, influence, to test the scenarios, and uh, to make choice uh, in accordance with the auditorium or some officials and yeah. so on. Okay. So to start uh, with the first question, I uh, so I never mentioned RPIs in the in the presentation. Uh, it, it's it's nothing to do with the software. Uh, the same thing can be achieved. We we use lots of open source in addition to Esri products. Uh, it's it's more about what is the question you want to answer. We we should start from the question, not from the software or technology. Usually, when we approach any entity, we don't want to sell any software. We want to understand what is the problem that they are trying to solve. Saying that, uh, how you can make it more to the public, uh, accessible to the public. Again, crowdsourcing is one of the main uh, topics. And there is lots of data now available. Uh, applications such as uh, Yandex, uh, Glovo and uh, Menu AM. These are collecting. These people are collecting huge amount of information. Where are the people who like the burgers the most? Where are the people who are very active in sports? Uh, when are the people who buys lots of tickets? And usually, outside, in, I don't know what is the situation in Armenia, but in uh, US or UAE, which I'm from. Uh, this kind of information is generating lots of revenue uh, for the people who has this kind of data because they are creating a segmentation of people. They are segmenting the people to understand where are the, uh, they have funny names like soccer moms, where are the ladies between 30 and 50 years old who has children, take them to soccer games, uh, so they can start selling them stuff. Uh, and we, I've worked on such project with one of the telecommunication uh, companies. It's, it's more about having a vision from the governmental sector, uh, having a vision about understanding the value of location data and opening it to the public, not closing it, because it will generate lots of revenue for the country at the end. I forgot your second question. What was it about? And the second one was about Meta. Yeah, Meta, Meta Universe, yes. So once uh, Facebook announced uh, Meta, everybody started to uh, jump on it. It was there like for the last 10 years. There was Google glances and all this. Uh, still, we see it as a, as a, it doesn't have this scientific value still. It's more a tool for the executives who like to, nice toys, who like nice toys especially in our region, in UAE. And uh, they like to see things on 3D, but scientifically, it doesn't advance anything more from what you have. It's just an experience, extra experience. Uh, that's it. Maybe it will. Uh, I had a startup who created augmented reality for kids to see the book in 3D and see the maps. Maybe it will help for the education, but for scientific research, I don't think. This is my personal uh, thing. Still, it's, we are not there. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Thank you very much for the <clears throat> presentation. It's really like an uh, interesting way to see the tools, etc. And uh, I would see using this kind of uh, technology in uh, planning, etc. Uh, I mean, urban planning, optimizing city problems, etc. So it should be very, very useful. Uh, and my question is from another side like how easy it to get cooperate with the um, like, uh, city uh, governments and administration yeah. not only in Armenia like in everywhere in the world like how easy it gets to uh, how easy they understand that this is very useful and it optimizes and uh, ready to use this kind of tools yeah it's uh, it's a bit difficult question. Uh, once you have the vision, and uh, see, every country has a national spatial uh, strategy, geospatial strategy. I am not sure if we still have it here, a geospatial strategy and vision. But 
on the other hand, both the Kadaster and Yerevan municipality, for example, they understand the importance of the, uh, this kind of information, and I believe they are investing to advance this knowledge and skills within their organization. What we need is a little bit maybe more transparency and understanding each other and sharing, the, the culture of sharing the information, which is still not there, I think. But in the world, is it easy to offer this kind of, like, is it used? Yes, yeah, it, they, of course, it's, we have 200, more than 200 countries, but uh, from the region which I come from, in UAE, for example, it's, it's very common, it's been there for the last 15 years, uh, both in UAE, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Bahrain, all these countries, they invested uh, 15 years ago. We're, we've been there for the last 30 years uh, by UK. They started the mapping process. Uh, all these countries understand the importance, and I believe here also we understand the problem. The only issue may be the limited resources that we have to invest in this, and that should be solved by understanding the importance and return on investment from the, uh, these kind of projects. It has both... Uh, urban development and planning uh, aspect and has the defense aspect to it. So it's very important. Yeah, it's kind of like as a follow-up. If there are cities that can be uh, used as an example, then it can be used as an argument. Like you see, they use these kind of tools to optimize traffic, to optimize green areas, etc. And it helps to really? make this kind of like, uh, prosperity for the for the city, so it will be easier to convince here or Yeah, Yeah, again, uh, our approach is to, to try to find the issue and try to solve it. So we go to, for example, I was spending two days with the statistics department here, Armstead. And it's not about uh, trying to convince them to use GIS, that's the wrong approach. It's more about understanding what is their current challenge uh, what are their priorities and try to find solutions for it. So we shouldn't try, the approach should not be we should have a GIS. The approach should be we have this problem, GIS might help it to solve it. Yeah. Yeah. Questions? Sorry, maybe uh, about the uh, uh, access to this uh, instrument, uh, as far as I know, it was very expensive to use uh, ArcGIS. Uh, then I think there is some kind of online uh, access and so on. What is the price policy for creating working space for people who would like to use this wonderful instrument? Yeah. Uh, so as you said, now lately we have the cloud environment. And... Uh, and the cloud environment uh, makes it much cheaper to, to use this kind of analysis. Of course, here I, I'm not here representing Esri. I'm representing uh, GeoVibe, which is a local Armenian company. But uh, it will be much cheaper to use the cloud. And this is what we preach usually here, that use it for a year or two, the cloud environment, even if it's not, you think that it's not very secure at least to make sure that you need and you get convinced and then you can move forward. Now, if you're asking about like price, how much is it? I cannot give you a price, but this is something between two to three thousand dollars per year to, to do something like this and do visualization to, like this. And then the requirements to internet connection is very, I think, very important. Yeah. What is the minimum speed of? No, no, normal, whatever now we have in the university or anywhere. I cannot give you like a number, but any normal internet connection, even on a mobile, it works. Yeah. And I think AUA is using ArcGIS online, and there are lots of nice story maps that the students here created. Thank you, Dean, for your nice presentation. Uh, I have a question about um, how it is easy to collect data in Armenia comparing with other countries, because every time we are dealing with these issues, it's not standardized and uh, it's very hard. 
even with the same division of government, with the different departments, these data are not matching, not specially, not even statistically. So as far as I understood, you collecting data. So what's your experience with this data? I mean, uh, non special and also with special data. Yeah, it, it was very difficult. That's why we had to create our own data. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have, still we don't have, I think there is a regulation now, but there is no authoritative resource for this kind of information, which is open to the public and they can use it to create new businesses and startups. So in our case, in the examples that I was showing, uh, the first example of Yerevan, Digital Twin, uh, we couldn't find any data. So we had to use artificial intelligence, deep learning to digitize the whole city. Uh, in the case of uh, uh, Ministry of Health for the emergency calls, again, unfortunately, the third party who was developing or operating their machines, and they had to give this 85,000 records, again, they didn't follow any standard. That's why, again, we had to use machine learning and NLP to geocode each call to the correct location. So. It's very important to follow standards. It doesn't have to be like 100 pages of standards, but at least basic stuff to have it. And for the time being, uh, we don't have it here. But at least, as far as I know, I, there is now a body, official body responsible for this, which is the cadaster. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you.